You are now tuning in to the King of Game, Tariq Elite on Tariq Elite Radio. I am delivered! Oh, we are back, 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 everybody. Glad to have everybody tuning in to Tariq Radio. Ready to drop a bet good game as we do. Now, don't forget, man, check out the brand new video game we got. The video game app is called Moorish Kingdom. Go to MoorishKingdom.com. Everybody's loving this game app. It's the first game app in history to be centered around the Moors, the African men who went in and ruled parts of Europe. This is the first game that even acknowledged, acknowledges the Moors. And this is a good game. It, it's a fight game. It's a battle game. It's a little violent, but it's a good game. It's a cool game. Your teens can take a look at it. It's about time that we start seeing heroes that look like us. And that was the main focal thing I had for making that, that video game. It's a real fun game and it's a very addictive game too. It's on iPhones and iPads. A lot of I got a lot of Android users out there. We're gonna have it ready for Android in a couple of months. It'll be ready for Android. A lot of you um, Android using brothers out there, y'all been complaining, well, we need it on Android. It's gonna be on Android. Now, some of you niggas are still rocking T-Mobile sidekicks. I can't even help you. I can draw you a picture. That's all I can do. But go to MoorishKingdom.com. That's the name of the app, and that's where you can download it on your iPhone or your iPad and have at it. And also, don't forget, let me thank everybody for contributing to the Indiegogo page we have for the new Morus app that's coming. We got a new social networking site called Morus, M-O-O-R-U-S, that's going to be centered around black empowerment, and that's going to be coming in a couple of months, too, and that's going to be huge. We're going to start having an exodus away from the Facebooks and all of the other social networking sites so that we can get our own thing popping so we will stop being censored. I, I, again, uh, I had a bunch of people today, about three or four people today hit me up talking about they've been blocked and banned from Facebook and all this stuff. And that's very interesting, man. Look, we, we got to understand this, family. And by the way, go to moreus.com, by the way. M-O-O-R-U-S.com to check out what Morris is about and you can contribute to the Indiegogo page, by the way. But if we don't own and control our mediums in this system of white supremacy, we're going to continue to be disenfranchised and displaced and censored and marginalized. This is why we have to control the stuff we do, family. we got to control what we do. Because the thing is, and I've said this a million times, the minute we stand up for ourselves, it's a problem. The minute we stand up, the dominant society, the people in the dominant society, they start playing the victim role. You know, with these, I'm looking at these Donald Trump rallies all over the country, and the white supremacists, boy, they're getting very bold now. Donald Trump has riled up all of the white extremists, the white supremacists, the white nationalists. He has... He has put a battery in their backs. All of these hillbilly hicks, all of them, he has put a battery in the backs of white supremacists. And not, not all white supremacists are hillbilly and hicks, by the way. Let's, let's be very clear. But the white supremacists out there are being, are, are really emboldened. And a lot of black people are, are surprised to see so many white supremacists around the country. And this is the wake up call that a lot of black folks need. We live in a system of white supremacy. So now you're giving the opportunists of the, the, the white supremacists an opportunity to stop being fake with you. See, our brother Neely Fuller talks about the relationship that we have with those in the dominant society, the relationship that black people have with those in the dominant society, particularly the white supremacists. He call it the three T's. I want to see, what was the first T? I think the first T is, um, what's the first T? Where are my people who's, who's in the chat room? What's the first T? I know one of them is tacky. 
and another one is terroristic. But what's the first T? I can't think of the first T, but he talks about the three T's of the types of relationships that black people have with the white supremacists. And the one main one is called tacky. It's just a real tacky relationship. It's very tacky. You know, it's, it's a fake relationship. We're fronting all the time. There's no real honesty in it. And then it becomes terroristic because now we're seeing the terroristic part. We're seeing the terroristic part of the white supremacist relationship. He's trashy. Thank you. Somebody in the tra chat room said that. Yes, it's a trashy relationship. That's it. The first relationship is trashy. Whenever the white supremacists come around black folks, it's always some degenerate shit they want to get into with us. They want us to start twerking. You know, they start talking in a fake slang. We become the entertainment. For example, the Oscars that just happened on TV, that was a trashy relationship between the white supremacists and black people. Very trashy. We become the entertainment. We, we're the laughing and joking people. Just like when Trump was doing his rally and then he brought up those two super coon mammies. He brought them out and like, okay, okay. Do your routine. Donald Trump is going to build that. Wow. They went out there looking like two Aunt Jemima pancake slaves. That's a trashy relationship. And the white supremacists are just giggling and laughing at him. See, that's a trashy relationship. And just like Neely Fuller said, it gets no better than tacky. Black people suffering is tacky. Black people being marginalized is tacky. And then when you stand up for yourself, then it becomes terroristic. Then they want to play the victim role and then they go into defense mode. But at these Donald Trump rallies, you might as well call them Klan rallies now because it's just loaded with open white supremacists. The Klan has openly endorsed them. Other white supremacist groups and, and, and leaders like Jared Taylor, all of these white supremacists are championing Donald Trump. This is a straight up white supremacist movement. And that's a great thing because now it wakes black folks up. I'm not afraid of them. Black folks are gotten, they're on this thing where, ooh, we got to just run for and vote for Hillary and Bernie because, ooh, what will happen if these racist white supremacists get in office? Well, shit, you already had Hillary. Y'all better stop acting like Hillary and Bill didn't do damage to black society. You understand that? We got to get off that fear thing. Give me my white supremacists on a platter. So now we know what we're dealing with. That'll wake up Negroes. So you'll stop being lulled to sleep by the Hillary Clintons out there. And the Bernie Sanders. I'm, I'm still not impressed with Bernie Sanders because they're not trying to do anything to help us specifically. And I've said this a million times. I'm not going to go into that. But at these Trump rallies, people are fighting. People are getting beat up. There was a black girl at one of these rallies. I think it was in Kentucky. And they were kicking her out and they were literally pushing and shoving and smacking the sister around. There was one old elderly white dude who kept pushing her. This one dude, this white supremacist named Michael Heinbeck. Now he's a known white supremacist. He's in, he has his own little white nationalist group. And he was smacking and pushing his sister around. They called all types of niggers and cunts. This was at a Trump political rally. This is how bold they're getting. And my thing is this, none of these white supremacists, when they assault black people, especially black women, they're not getting investigated. They're doing it on camera. The news is running it. And these people are going around bragging about doing it, but they're not getting investigated. These white supremacists can terrorize us and do anything they want to, but they don't get investigated. But, and another thing too about that, when this black girl is out here getting pushed around and smacked around and shoved and called all types of niggas and cunts, where in the hell are all the white feminist groups? Where are all the white feminist groups? Where, where you at? Where they at though? All you Negro bedwinches that sit up and lap at the teat of these fake ass white supremacist feminist groups 
Y'all kiss their asses, you Negro bedwinches and mammies, talking that intersectionality nonsense. Where they at now? How come they never intersect for your black ass? They never go against anybody in the dominant society for you, no matter what they do to you. Where they at, though? Now, the minute one of these white supremacist females come around with a video of a black man talking to her on the streets, they can galvanize all the Negro bedwitches to help promote some holla back or street harassment campaign. But when you got white supremacist males out here smacking up black women at a damn political rally, out of all places, none of the, the feminist groups, the white ones, I'm talking about them, I'm not talking, ain't no such thing as a black feminist group. You got a bunch of trolls on Twitter. It's not a feminist organization. All right, let's just be real. I'm talking about the white females feminist organizations that get funding and actually do things and actually have panache and, and clout within the media. They're very quiet. I just don't, uh, don't let that fact slip you up. Don't let that slip by. But when a black woman is getting her ass pushed around and smacked around and called all types of niggas and cunts by a white person, they always show a camaraderie. These white supremacist female so-called feminists, they never go against their own for a black person. They stick to code. That's part of the code. And that brings me out to the, the KKK plan rally that happened out here in SoCal last week. And I talked about this on Ustream. The Klan came out to the West Coast and they got a good old fashioned West Coast ass whooping. Now, I was talking about this on my Ustream and on my Ustream, I, I, I talked about how the Klan went to different cities and they were allowed to do whatever they had to do. Now, let me, I will say South Carolina represented. Shout out to the young folks in South Carolina. I'm not talking about those elderly coons that's out there. South Carolina is full of elderly coons. Let's just keep it 100. That's why those elderly coons were the majority of the voters for, for Hillary and they helped her win the Democratic primary out there. She, she pandered to that whole, I forgive Dylan Roof, I forgive the cop that shot Walter Scott. She pandered to that old elderly Negro church coon crowd. But the young people there in South Carolina about that life, because when the Klan was out there, the young brothers and sisters was about to give the Klan that work. The cops saved the Klan out there. See, what happened was the Klan was able to set up shop and get around the cops so the cops can protect them. Out here, it was a different story. Out here, the brothers didn't let the Klan get an opportunity to get protection from the cops. The brothers out here, see, we specialize in catching motherfuckers slipping. So they got them motherfuckers slipping the minute they got out the car. The minute the Klan pulled up out there in um, Anaheim and got out the car, the ass whoopings commenced brothers gave them that work and rightfully so because you are dealing with a terrorist organization that's all the clan is let's stop playing games the clan is a terrorist organization and those brothers were protecting the community from terrorism but a lot of those brothers were arrested and some of the charges are very interesting some of the charges some of the brothers got arrested for elder abuse because they considered some of the clan members older so they were elders you see that they, they're trying to portray these terrorist clan members as old, feeble, elderly people who were abused by the Negroes. But when you look at this Donald Trump rally, that was an elderly white supremacist pushing that sister around. Now, if somebody turned around and knocked his fucking jaw off, then he would have been on that victim shit. And yeah, I, I do, somebody in the chat room said they plan a, there's gonna be another march in April at Stone Mountain, Georgia. In Stone Mountain, they're gonna, and that's a real big white supremacist location. The Klan, they always meet out there in Stone Mountain. And April, that's why my tour starts in April, by the way, family. I'm going on a lecture tour in April, and the reason why I chose April is because black folks, the white supremacists are gonna show out this April. The white supremacists, they're really emboldened. And I've always told you, April is like a religious month for white supremacists. It's like a holy month. 
it's like their jihad month. So there's a lot of shit that they do around April. So there's a lot of fuckery. So we need to be on code. We need to be codified. We need to be on the same page. And I'm going to be touring around the country to make sure that we stay on code and have our shit together. I'm going to be in um, possibly D.C., I might be there on the 20th of April, but I want my DC people to hit me up. Let me know some venues out there. Email me at info at Let me know some venues we can get out there in DC. We already got the venue in New York. I will definitely be in New York on Monday, April 25th. That's confirmed. Tickets will go on sale next week. We're working on Dallas now. If I do Dallas which we're trying to confirm this week. It will probably be on April 29th. That's a Friday. Houston is confirmed. I'm going to be at the Shrine of Black Madonna on on April 30th. I will be in Miami on April 23rd. And tickets will be on sale at TariqLive.com next week. I'm just giving you guys a heads up on that. It's called the More Rush Tour. But I was saying about us staying on code because like I said the brothers out here they defended the community from the terrorists who are the clan and the cops would they arrested a lot of brothers and charged them for assault and all this stuff but they're not doing it for these white supremacists that harm black people at these Trump rallies that's not the first time a black person got roughed up at a Trump rally So that's why we got to stay on code, fam. And don't be don't be scared into voting. Just get your game type, protect yourself, get your food and water ready. Let the shit go down. When Trump, if Trump gets in office, which I doubt, I still doubt, but it, it, there is a possibility. But let the shit go down. Let it go down. We need a reset button. All hell will break loose, which is good which is good. Now, we we respond better when there's some real white supremacy going on. Black people get on their P's and Q's. We need to get on our P's and Q's. Maybe that'll stop all the twerking and the bullshit when we see that these white supremacists aren't really playing with us no more. Then y'all start listening to people like me, people like Brother Kaba, people like Phil Valentine, people like Jane Small, people like Jason Black, people like... Shahrazad Ali, the whole Hidden Colors cast, people like Claude Anderson, then you'll start taking heed to what we've been telling you nonstop about living in this system of white supremacy and what we need to do. But I digress, ladies and gentlemen. But another thing, family, the white supremacists, they don't like taking L's, and I've talked about that many times. The white supremacists, they do not like taking L's. And when they take an L, when they take a loss, they like to go and look back at their losses and figure out what went wrong. See, black people, we're the opposite. We get a little victory and then we celebrate for 200 damn years. We get one minor little victory and then we want to celebrate. We got to stop doing that. That's why I didn't stop with one hidden colors. I could have just sat back and celebrated people giving me props and all that, but I'm like, no, we need to keep going because the white supremacists are going to keep going. And there's a reason why I wanted to keep going because, again, the white supremacists, they got billions of dollars to put out there to promote white supremacy. That's why they keep putting all this money into these failed white Egyptian movies. Like another movie, Gods of Egypt. That one didn't flopped. That flopped like we knew. And I thank the conscious and the knowledgeable brothers and sisters out there for word of mouth, putting the knowledge out there. See, when they try to promote that nonsense on social media, brothers and sisters shut that shit down. Just like with um, Exodus, that was shut down by social media. Because people are waking up now and we're like, oh, no, we, 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 we're not taking that. We're not accepting that. We're not accepting that. So they have a, a treasure chest of resources to give to maintain white supremacy. So we can't stop. We got to keep putting the knowledge and the information out there. That's why we get in the whole social networking app, because when we try to talk about certain things on 
social media, they've learned to ban us now because social media is the new media. This is where people go to get media. You don't need traditional terrestrial television and radio to do your thing. You can get your messages across and information across with social media. So now they're trying to come up with ways to censor you and ban you. That's why the Morris app is going to be revolutionary. But like I said, the white supremacists, they do not like taking L's. And one thing they took an L in is the O.J. Simpson case. Now, the O.J. Simpson case was the trial of the century. The white supremacists lost on that and they've been nullifying juries. They've manipulated the jury system, the court system to kind of fix up those cracks. That's why they have all these all white juries now. That's why they go out of their way to tell people that this case is not about race whenever there's a case about race. That's because of the OJ trial. The white supremacists have gotten on code and we got to understand how they get down. That's why they have this new show, The People vs. O.J. Simpson. Basically, this show, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. I hope It's a very good show. It's a very good show. I watch it religiously. I love it because I like to see what the white supremacists are up to. And also, the acting is superb in this. I do see and I do understand that it's extremely slanted. It has a white supremacist slant on it. Now, there's some things that kind of annoy me about it. They keep making these gratuitous references to the Kardashians. That's so tired. That becomes corny real fast. Almost every episode, they find a way to slip in Kim Kardashian, Khloe Kardashian. They'll they'll slip in their names. Because the Kardashians are hot now, and Rob Kardashian was... um, The dad was OJ's best friend, so they keep slipping in the Kardashian girls' names in the series that has has nothing to do with the case or the series whatsoever, but they just find a way to slip their names in it. And a lot of the stuff is embellished on this thing. But I, I see what they're doing. What they're doing, they're giving out codes and they're giving out dog whistles on what to do when a trial like this comes up. This is what you do. This is how you exclude black jurors. This is what you do when you get another slick Negro like Johnny Cochran. See, that's the thing. Johnny Cochran was phenomenal. Johnny Cochran was one of the best lawyers in the history of America. White or black, don't let nobody fool you. Johnny Cochran was that damn dude. Johnny Cochran was the dude all day. That's why in the OJ trial, it was OJ getting a lot of death threats, but in the middle of the trial, it was Johnny Cochran who received a bunch of death threats because Johnny Cochran was making white supremacy look stupid. Johnny Cochran was turning white supremacy on its ear. He was calling white supremacy out on live television around the world and whooping white supremacy's ass. That brother had a mouthpiece out of this world. Johnny Cochran was known to win cases. This brother represented Michael Jackson. He represented um, Todd Bridges. I mean, Johnny represented everybody. He represented Puffy. He, He got Puffy off when that whole thing with Puffy and Shine were in the club and people got shot. He represented Puff. And after Johnny Cochran won the OJ case, Johnny Cochran said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get Geronimo Pratt out of prison. That was one of the things I've been meaning to do. And this brother went and did it. (laughs) Now, Johnny Cochran doing the OJ trial, Johnny was getting so many threats, Johnny had to have the, the, the Nation of Islam come and protect him. That really burned the fucking asses of the white supremacists to see this brother in his spitting all this hot fire then he's walking in the court with the nation of Islam they thought the fucking world was over then they thought the world was over then and also when Johnny got my man Geronimo Pratt out of prison Johnny was like I'm about to go get reparations Johnny was about to get reparations for black people in America 
then he mysteriously died. I really wish we investigate our brother's death. I really wish we investigate our brother's death. Now, since this show has been on TV, The People vs. O.J. Simpson, I've seen some white supremacists getting a little salty. I, I read the Twitter comments, and some people, are, white supremacists are low-key saying, well, yeah, Johnny Cochran, he died not too long after the case. That was karma. Fuck out of here. Because where's George Zimmerman's karma? Where's Pantaleo's karma? Where's Darren Wilson's karma? Let's, let's not let's not go there. But the thing is, with this case and this show, they're slanting this show to make it seem like OJ was guilty. And black people, you got to be very clear. Don't fall for the "I'm white and I say so" logic, because that's basically what it's really about. It's really about we're white and we say so. And if people in the dominant society keep repeating the same thing over and over again, OJ really did it, OJ really did it, OJ really did it, because a court of law proved that he did not do it. They said he didn't do it. And the reason why they don't take that verdict seriously is because black people on the jury, they try to give the impression that black people are incompetent and incapable of being fair and balanced. Well, that would make black people like um, the white supremacists, huh? Because the white supremacists, they have a history of not being fair and balanced, even when there's blatant evidence there. Even when there's a damn confession. And we see that with cases now. So it's very disrespectful to the black jury giving the impression that they didn't somehow look at the evidence and weigh the evidence and judge their decision based on the evidence, which is what they did. But the system of white supremacy is basically based on we're white and we say so. And you're supposed to find him guilty because we say so. Look at all the evidence. But when you look at all the so-called evidence, there is reasonable doubt. There's a lot of reasonable doubt and there's a lot of stuff that this TV show will not tell you. Now, let's look at the OJ case, family. Let, let's just, because I remember this thing like it was yesterday. A lot of my people who are older, y'all remember back in the 90s when this whole thing was going on. People were like, well, black people didn't want to convict OJ because he was a hero to the black community. That, my friends, is utter bullshit. Let me say that again. OJ Simpson was not a hero in the black community. That's bullshit. OJ Simpson was a hero to white people. OJ Simpson was a hero to white people. Black people weren't really fucking with OJ like that, not in the 90s. We didn't hate on him, but we were like, okay, this another nigga got him some money doing what he do. All right, whatever. So there wasn't no kind of camaraderie or no bond we had with no damn OJ Simpson, but we didn't want to see an injustice though. Wasn't like we loved O.J. Simpson so fucking much. Nobody gave a shit about O.J. You never saw brothers in the hood talking about, man, O.J. Simpson is the shit. Not in the 90s. Nobody gave a fuck about O.J. But we didn't want to see an injustice. We did not want to see an injustice. And when you look at the case, there's a lot of holes and basically... The whole premise of the case, number one, what they're telling us is O.J. Simpson woke up one day. He was on his way. He had a flight planned to Chicago. And before the flight, he decided for no apparent reason, evidently, to get up and go take a knife and a, a hat and some gloves over to his ex-wife's house and kill her. And there's a, another dude who happened to be there, so he killed him, too. Went and got rid of all this evidence, got rid of the knife, got rid of the gloves and the, the clothes, washed up, cleaned up, hopped on a plane like nothing happened. There's a lot of holes in just that. See, when you break this shit down and look at it, stop looking at it from white supremacy filters. Because according to the white supremacists, Mike Brown ran through bullets to grab Darren Wilson's gun. So... In white supremacist world, we're super niggas. 
let's take the super nigga shit out of it for one minute. Just like Trayvon, they had, Trayvon was a super nigga if you let the white supremacists tell it. Trayvon Martin was walking home, then George Zimmerman came up and asked him a friendly question, then Trayvon used his 17 year old super nigga strength to pick up this big chunky ass grown man and beat him to his death almost, and he had to be shot. So forget the super nigga element for a second. O.J. Simpson really didn't have a motive. He wasn't with Nicole anymore. They're trying to say, well, he was so abusive. He was so abusive. Yeah, he had an abusive relationship with her, but he wasn't with that woman at the moment. So for him to just wake up that day and say, hey, I'm going to go over here and kill her. There was no motive for that. They never explained the reasoning behind that. They never explained that. And number one, look, there was no motive. There was no murder weapon. They never found a murder weapon. There were no witnesses. There were no bloody clothes. They found a glove at the place. And then they said they found another glove at his house. Neither of the gloves fit him. I mean, we, we can't breathe past this shit. The glove didn't fit that dude. When he tried the gloves on, they didn't fit him. And I'm going to get on that, the blood evidence in a minute. I'll get on that in a second. And these are reasonable questions here. Even if you like, oh, I hate that. For the last 20, 25 years, we've been hearing that he did it, he did it, he did it. And he got off unjustly. And that's why they got revenge on him at that case in Vegas. Up in Vegas, that was a revenge case. That's all it was. OJ Simpson is in jail right now for 33, got a 33-year sentence for stealing his own stuff. That's revenge. Basically what Johnny Conker was talking about, how people use the judicial system for revenge and vendettas. So he was right. But when you look at the case, let's look at all of it. One thing that you notice they never do, they never go into the background of Nicole Brown Simpson. Because when you are a white person, and you've been victimized or even killed, you shouldn't put the victim on trial, but you always put the victim on trial when they're black. It's okay to put a victim on trial when they're black. When Walter Scott got shot in the back, oh, they start talking about the child support he owed. He was arrested for child support. When Trayvon Martin was killed, well, he, he was acting out in school. You put the dead child on trial. When Mike Brown was killed, you put the dead teen on trial. When Sandra Bland ended up dead down in Texas, they started to put her on trial, talking about how she got arrested for marijuana 10 years ago. So you always happen to put the black people who are victims, you put them on trial, but we're told to not put people in the dominant society on trial. So since it's okay, to bring up the background of Sandra Bland and Rakia Boyd and Renisha McBride and all of these black people that have been killed or died mysteriously since it's okay, according to the dominant society, to go into their background, go into Nicole Simpson's background. Nicole Simpson, if we're gonna look at it from the dominant society's perspective and go into people's backgrounds and see if that caused anything to do with their murder, and I don't say that Nicole Brown Simpson's background justifies her murder. She should not have been killed. But when you look at her background, she wasn't a soccer mom. If we're going to talk about Sandra Bland's background and Trayvon's background, we can talk about Nicole Brown Simpson's background. And Nicole Brown Simpson was a druggie. She hung around druggies. She hung around drug addicts like Faye Resnick. They sat around doing coke, sucking dicks all the time. That's, that's the reality. Faye Resnick said this. Even in the show, Faye Resnick talked about how they were out there sucking dicks all in Brentwood. How they called a blowjob a Brentwood. And Nicole Brown had several sex partners after OJ. Nobody investigated these people? They're not telling you all this on the show. But that's something that you have to look into. This sister, she wasn't a soccer mom. That don't mean she deserved to get killed but she was hanging around unscrupulous people. So that could have contributed to what happened to her. 
somebody she was around. She shouldn't have died. Let's be very clear. Let's just be very clear. Now on the show, there was a scene, I think on, on the show, the, the OJ Simpson trial show, they said, because this is the thing, they will throw out a lot of shit, but then they won't have anybody to counter it. They will throw out a bunch of stuff and they'll say something like, well, Nicole Brown Simpson had called a, a women's shelter four days before she was killed. Then they'll stop right there. That's a half truth. That's a half truth because that's based on the testimony, what they're not telling you, of a woman who worked at a woman's shelter who said a few days before the murder, some anonymous woman named Nicole called up and said she was being abused by her ex-husband. The woman didn't say she was Nicole Brown Simpson. It was just a, an anonymous woman named Nicole. See, when you put it all in context like that, then you can say, oh, okay, that's not as cut and, it's not as cut and dry as they're making it seem. Also, the woman who worked at the shelter, a lot of people, the defense, some of OJ's defense lawyers were saying that this woman was possibly saying that as a way to get funding for her shelter. Because the white supremacist females are known to do that. They're known to take a case and try to interject, interject themselves into something so that they can get funding. Because understand this. The O.J. Simpson trial, a lot of these white supremacist feminist groups and women's groups, they made a grip in the 90s over that O.J. shit. Understand this. In the 70s, and I talked about this before, a lot of these white feminist groups started these women's shelters and these rape centers because they went around talking about how afraid they were that black men were going to rape them. This was very big in the 70s. These women got millions of dollars going around talking about, ooh, these black men, are, these black men coming into these cities, they're gonna rape me, so I need about five, ten million dollars for my shelter for for women who will fear rape. That was real big in the 70s. There was a resurgence of that with the OJ trial. A lot of you look in the mid 90s, a lot of these women groups, abuse groups, battery, shelter, shelter groups popped up because of OJ. They'll use a black person and make them the poster child of white victimhood let's look even with bill cosby you know what bill cosby they have used the bill cosby accusations to get laws passed in certain states in nevada because of bill cosby they've moved the statutes of limitations of rape to 20 years now i think it was like after four years you couldn't do anything but now they made it 20 years directly because of bill cosby So they will use black folks to monetize a lot of movements and create a whole fear campaign and capitalize off of it. So this woman who said that Nicole called the shelter, some people question that. Some people question that she was just using that to get donations for her shelter. But they didn't tell you that on the show. Because again, they just put a whole bunch of shit out there, but they don't put it all in context. They don't have anybody counter the stuff. And then they start talking about the DNA that was found at the crime scene. There was DNA in the Bronco and in, in OJ's car. Then there was DNA at his house. But what they leave, uh, they'll probably talk about this on the show later on. But the DNA. Because I remember, again, I remember this case like it was yesterday. The DNA had a chemical in it, EDTA, which that's the chemical that they put in the, when you take a blood sample or blood, you collect blood, they put this EDTA drug or chemical in there so that the blood doesn't clot. And all of the blood they found that said, that they said was OJ and Nicole's and all that, it had that chemical in it. And nobody could ever really explain why. The only way to explain why this, the, the blood samples all over the place had this chemical in it is because most likely somebody poured it there. And this is not far-fetched. You had this dude named Detective Van Adder who took OJ's blood, but he did not bring the blood back to the lab. They're not telling you that. This dude carried the blood with him for an unspecified amount of time. And also there was a lot of blood 
OJ's blood was missing from the lab. They wrote it down, but they couldn't find it. So there's, it was so much suspicious stuff going on with the OJ trial. And then you had this dude, Mark Furman. And they're going to talk about Mark Furman more next week. They, In the TV show, they talked about him a little bit. They showed that you know he, he was a Nazi sympathizer. And that's just the half of it. This dude was a straight up and down white supremacist. See, they tried to really minimize Mark Furman's racism. They tried to minimize Mark Furman's racism. And you can't do that. Because let's look at the case. Now, Mark Furman, LAPD cop, a lot of folks don't know that Mark Furman had been out to that house, to OJ's house before, I think back in 85. He'd been out to the house before on a call. He'd been to the house before. So now, he's already been out to the house, so he already feels a, a certain type of way about OJ, a black man accused of harming a white woman, and Mark Furman specifically stated he doesn't like interracial relationships none of those white extremists do none of those white extremists like interracial relationships because they feel that's white genocide and this guy was a straight up white supremacist and with Mark Furman I remember in the 90s they kept trying to portray him as a rogue cop he's a rogue oh he's a rogue they kept saying that in the media he's a rogue he's on his own he's a loner He's a renegade. Mark Furman was not no damn renegade. Mark Furman did not act in a vacuum. Mark Furman, that mentality he had was standard for the LAPD at that time and probably still now. He was not a rogue. That's how the LAPD would operate. They had a bunch of race soldiers working as police officers, posing as cops. All my people from L.A., they know the deal. Let me play. The chief of police at the time was a guy named Daryl Gates. Now, Daryl Gates was a piece of work. Daryl Gates was a piece of work out here. Daryl Gates, he was behind. He was the dude behind that. The batter ram, battering rams going up in people's houses. But this is an interview that Daryl Gates did in the mid 90s talking about this case. Now, this is Daryl Gates. This is the top cop in L.A. at the time. And the LAPD of today, you have to understand Daryl Gates. For instance, while Gates denounces Mark Furman, he does not denounce racism. In the United States of America, you have the constitutional right to hold any thoughts you want to, a constitutional right. It's only when you act on those thoughts and do something that is a violation of law. You have a constitutional right to hold any thought no matter how evil that thought is, you have a constitutional right to be a racist. Are you saying you have a thought. constitutional right to be a racist? Sure you do. Absolutely. Just as long as you don't practice it. As long as you don't practice it in some significant way that is a violation of law, you have a right to do that in this country. That's why it makes us... Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, you, did you, this is Daryl Gates. He said you have a constitutional right to be a racist. Not, hey, you know, racism is bad. You shouldn't be. No, nah, if you're a cop, you, you really shouldn't be a racist if you're on the police force. This is the top cop in L.A. talking about you have a constitutional right to be a racist long as you don't act on it in a significant factor. He didn't even say don't act on it, just not significantly. This is the top cop in L.A. And you see why L.A. burned down under his watch. And you see why L.A. burned to the ground. People will lit this bitch up. That's that's the mentality. So don't let them run this whole game that Mark Furman was somehow working in a vacuum. This was the, the chief of police of L.A. Totally justifying racism. So that was the mentality at that time out here. That's why we were catching hell. That's why they would beat Rodney King's ass and then lie and cover it up. And when black folks get shot, the, they would get off of the, the people who did it would give them slaps on the wrist. And understand this, man. 
out here, Daryl Gates, he was all up, he was part of that whole SWAT teams thing. You know, the SWAT team was created for black people out here. SWAT teams, as the, the, the special weapons and tactical, all that stuff, that was created specifically for black people. He was, Daryl Gates was around when all that shit was happening. They created the SWAT team because of the Watch Riots. Because black people turned up out here in 1965. A few years after that, they created SWAT specifically for black people to, to stop black people from uprising. And the, the newly formed SWAT had a shootout with the Black Panthers on Central Avenue. They, they, they created the SWAT team to wage war on black people. And that SWAT team mentality, you know, they still had it going into the 90s. That's why in the 80s, they would roll those fucking batarams up in people's houses. Look at that first scene out of Straight Outta Compton. When they roll that, that batarang up in the, the, the trap house. That shit happened all the time out here, man. But I digress as far as that. But you got to understand this. Don't let them try to minimize Mark Furman's racism. They've always tried to minimize this dude's racism, and his racism had a lot to do with what went down in this case, and my brother Johnny Cochran called him out on it, and I want to see how this show is going to portray his racism, because next week they're going to talk a lot about it. I want to see how deep into Furman's racism they're going to get into, because they keep trying to make it seem that black people somehow unjustly allowed a a man to get away with murder, but when you look at Mark Furman, there's reasonable doubt there. There's reason to believe that this dude might plant evidence based on his own damn words. Because Mark Furman, he made a, a, a tape of him talking to this woman who was writing a screenplay. He was talking to this woman and she video, not video taped him, but she audio taped him and they used some of the audio tape in court. They only used a little bit. The transcripts are worse. They only were allowed to use a little bit of the audio of him just saying nigga like it was a comma. Just calling black folks all types of niggas. Talk about how he want to beat up black folks, how he set up black folks and plant evidence on black folks. In his own words. And he, this is a woman he just met. So he was comfortable enough to say all this shit with a woman he literally just met. Just imagine what he was saying on the force. All the people who he worked with, they knew he was a white supremacist. All the people he worked with knew he was a white supremacist. Mark Furman hated black people. And I ain't talking about just a, a, a little minor dislike. He despised black people. And he especially hated black men banging white women. He was a Nazi sympathizer. He, he collected Nazi memorabilia. He admitted, in his own words, to pulling over interracial couples because he didn't like interracial couples and he would manufacture evidence against them and make up a reason to pull them over. These are his words. So it's not that far-fetched to believe that this dude would plant some shit. It's not far-fetched. And when they asked him in court, hey, Mark Furman, did you plant those gloves at, the, at OJ's house? People forget. He was like, well, I plead the fifth. When they asked Mark Furman if he planted evidence in court, he kept pleading the fifth. He didn't even say no. But he talks about in the transcripts, and I want you guys to look up the transcripts of Mark Furman talking to this, um, this female. He talked about how he would pull black folks over and rip their licenses up and then arrest them for not having licenses. He did all types of slick shit. He talked about how he would get a black person who was a drug user and look for their, look for track marks on his arm. He would scratch the scab and make the scab bleed and then say, okay, this person is doing drugs right now, so I gotta book him. Then the, the woman asked, okay, well, damn, isn't that, is that tampering of evidence? He's like, no, 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 that's, that's not falsifying a report. That's putting a criminal in jail. That's his words. That was his mentality. This guy went on and on and on and on how he planted evidence, manipulated facts, falsified reports on black people. So it's, it's not a stretch of the imagination 
to believe that this dude planted evidence on OJ. Do you know Mark Furman said, according, I'm, 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 I got receipts, by the way. All of this stuff I, I'm saying can be verified. Look up a woman, there's a white lady named Kathleen Bell. These are white people telling on him. These are white people telling on him. So people will use that whole, oh, race car, race car. You got other white people telling how racist you are. There's a white woman named Kathleen Bell who worked as a realtor at a place where Furman was uh, a, a, like a Marine recruiting place. And this is what she said. She was a witness. She was a reluctant witness, but she was a witness. And she said she had a conversation with Mark Furman. And, and I'm, I'm going to read word for word what she said. She said, I don't know how the subject was raised, but Officer Furman said that when he sees a nigger, as he calls it, driving with a white woman, he would pull them over. I asked him if he didn't have a reason. I said, what if he didn't have a reason? He said he would find one. Now, Kathleen Bell said, I looked at the other Marines there to see if he was joking, but it became very obvious that he was very serious. She also said, Mark Furman went on to say he would love nothing more to see all niggers gathered together and killed. Something about burning them or bombing them. These are white people telling on Mark Furman. Mark Furman talked about rounding black people up and killing us. So you think this dude wouldn't plant no evidence? Look up what I'm saying. All of this stuff, they don't talk about this in the media. They love to brush this dude's racism to the side. No, 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 no. Bring that shit out. His racism shouldn't be swept to the side. He, in his own words, he goes on and on and on. Mark Furman went on and on and on to anybody who would listen about how he loves playing evidence on black folks. According to him, damn, that's all he did his whole career was get black folks hemmed up and then lie. The transcripts also said, Mark Furman said that the ACLU, because at the time, the NAACP and the ACLU, they were filing a lot of lawsuits against the LAPD for all the damn brutality. Mark Furman said, quote, the ACLU should be bombed and everybody there should be killed in it. This dude just went on and on and on talking about murdering blacks, committing genocide against blacks, planting evidence against blacks, nigga this, nigga that, nigga, 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 nigga. But when we say, hey, man, there's some, I don't know about this guy. He might have done something slick. Oh, that's the race card. There's a lot of other slick shit he did. Somebody at the police force said he wrote a swastika on somebody's locker when he found out the police officer married a Jewish woman. Somebody at the police force said that he bragged about having some kind of intimate relationship with Nicole Brown Simpson. So Mark Furman's shit has really been swept under the rug. So it is not a leap of the imagination to believe that this person who just happened to find a glove a uh, pair of gloves that didn't fit. He's the one who found a pair of gloves who didn't fit. A guy who has all of this disdain for black people. Not just hate, not just anger, just genocidal disdain. Hey, somebody said we should write a The Truth About Mark Furman Melanoid Nation article. Thank you so much, sister. I'm glad you said that. And also, we do we need more writers for MelanoidNation.org. We need brothers and sisters. If you're trying to get into the writing game, we need you to contribute um, articles to the site. Email me at kflex 4 life at yahoo.com. Kflex, the number four, life at yahoo.com. If you're trying to get your writing game up, email me so you can volunteer stories for the site. Because we do need some new writers for the site to keep the content fresh. But we do need to write an article about that. Talking about the truth about Mark Furman. Because, you know, Fox News, you know, White Supremacist Central. You know, they have him on there as a contributor. But this dude was a white supremacist psychopath. Do not let them tell you anything differently. So it is very believable that this dude planted evidence and lied and manipulated and had everybody... 
all on board because that's what they do. As we see in police cases now or race soldier cases, we see it now. Just like in Chicago, when you see a person get shot in the back and all of the race soldiers working in law enforcement will look out for each other and lie and cover each other's back and the cover up goes all the way up to the DA. Everybody, they all know how to cover up shit because they've had practice. It's not a stretch of the imagination to believe that there was some evidence planted at OJ spot because they didn't have any real evidence, no real motive, no real murder weapon. So they were like, okay, well, look, we're going to get this nigga this time. We'll get this nigga this time. We ain't got enough evidence, but we'll make evidence. Just like Mark Furman always said that he did. Th these are his words. So don't fall for the propaganda, black folks, because a lot of times the white supremacists, they will present a one-sided story and then we'll fall for that because you don't get the other side. That's why it's very important that we have our own media outlets and we start with our social networking because they're not going to tell you what I said. I, that, I want to see what they're going to say on the next show. I want to see what they're going to say on the next show. But I digress, ladies and gentlemen. Anyway, y'all, let me get up out of here. Don't forget, family, go to MoorishKingdom.com. That's where you can play the game Moorish Kingdom. Go to Morus.com, M-O-O-R-U-S. Don't forget that I'm going to be going on my lecture tour in April. I'll keep you guys posted on that. Don't forget to check out Hidden Colors 1, 2, and 3 at HiddenColorsFilm.com. Don't forget to check out my pay-per-view special lectures at TariqRadio.com. And you can subscribe to this show on iTunes. Go to iTunes, type in Tariq Radio, and you can get the show downloaded to your iPhone, to your iPad automatically when I do it. I'm going to holla. I will check you guys out on Ustream this Sunday. And y'all have a good night.